OK. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for inviting us and listening to us talk. So my name is Freddie. I go by B. Maison on almost everything. Um, that's Jen. She goes by Redshift Zero on almost everything. And we're going to be talking about Lucy Parsons' lab, some of our projects, how they relate to transparency, and then Secure Drop uh, in particular. Um, <clears throat> So, so who was Lucy Parsons? We named our nonprofit over this woman who was a wobbly. She was an anarchist organizer during the time of large-scale large scale labor unrest. She was once called the most dangerous woman in Chicago. Uh, so, and she fits really well into sort of our politics. So we decided to name our nonprofit around her. Uh, yeah, and so uh, the nonprofit is myself and Jen, Brian, who's back there. Uh, who's also a sysadmin, as you said, and Mason, who's also a sysadmin. So uh, basically, we're kind of at this intersection of like technology, activism, um, data science, and transparency. So we focus on a lot of things like digital rights, but also how that impacts people that live on the street. And you know, so when we talk about like surveillance, we don't think about surveillance as like this, you know, Big Brother's watching you. We think about like, oh, wow, you're an undocumented worker. You know, it matters that someone is asking you for your uh, papers as you're walking down the street. Um, so that's kind of the frame that we like to work out of. Um, and so that's our mission, I guess. Um, so previous projects, we wrote a surveillance primer. So we took all of the technologies that, uh, th that we know that the city uses and we put them into a tool. So the link is there. So for example, we have all of the uh, cameras, the red light or the blue light cameras. Uh, that are around the city, we put them in like a, they're all geocoded, so you can like go see the closest one to Braintree if you want. Um, I think it's right outside of the train station. It might be like two or three blocks away. Um, I found, uh, I wrote a resource on identifying police officers who have killed for some really terrible language in the police uh, contract, police union contract. The city will refuse to release names. And I think that's horrible because if you're a family that's grieving, that stuff should be public. Um, there are states and uh, cities where this is the case, but that's not the case in Chicago. So I was like, well, whatever, I don't care. Uh, so I wrote a guide for that. Um, and we also do things like letter writing campaigns for, politi for political prisoners and things like that. Um, so I encourage you to check out some of our previous projects. Um, our current project is with Mock Rock. Is anyone familiar with Mock Rock? Um, so they're a platform for sending Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, so with FOIA, there's often a lot of back and forward. There's a lot of uh, following up. Um, so this platform will just say, like, I want to go FOIA the Chicago Water Department for these records. It will send automatic follow-ups. It will host your documents once you get them. It's really nice, and it's really like it's kind of like the standard of what we would hope all FOIA record keeping would be like, uh, even on like on a government level, but it's not. So you know they kind of fit that need. Um, our project is about civil asset forfeiture. Is anyone familiar with that? So it's so civil asset forfeiture is a, a program that allows uh, your property to be seized. It could be cash. It could be a car. It's usually cash or cars. Um, if you've been suspected of a crime, um, you don't have to prove that a person is like guilty. You don't have to be. You don't even have to be charged with a crime uh, to be to have your property seized. So what we've done is we've analyzed um, five years, moving into the sixth year now, all of the uh, expenditures that the Chicago Police Department has done with that money. Um, so we found two surprising things. The first is that, um, or maybe not surprising. The first is that it funds a lot of everyday operations of the police department, like, you know, phones for uh, undercover drug buys, things like uh, car repairs for seized vehicles, um, things that would normally come out of a police budget if anyone was looking or asking questions. Um, the other thing that we found was that a lot of the surveillance programs that we find uh, are funded through asset forfeiture, so like automatic license plate readers, cell site simulators, um, things like that. Uh, so that was another thing that we found. And we're working with Joe Hanley and the Chicago Reader to publish our investigation in the next month or two. We're going to have our first article out about this stuff. And um, so if you're interested, we're, we've done five years of analysis. We're hoping to keep this going on an, on, on an ongoing basis. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, so 
Uh, there's the link there, or you can obviously just come talk to us. <coughs> so there are limitations to doing FOIA. Um, a lot of it is, uh, again, one of the reasons we like MuckRock is because they do all of this automatic follow-up. Um, but you'll find things like eight months later, you don't get any records. Um, you'll find that sometimes they're over-redacted. Um, and the most interesting things are usually uh, you know, kept secret. You might have to file a lawsuit. Um, institutions don't really like, like to open themselves up to public inspection. Um, so the most interesting stuff requires a lawsuit. I think I've filed probably five or six FOIA lawsuits in the last two years um, and filing another two. And that stuff isn't cheap, and it's a huge pain. Um, and it's just like really basic stuff that I ask for. You know, like go give me this download in this email, and here's the date and the timestamp. And I can't even get that. Um, some really basic kind of questions. And so that's kind of the limitation of FOIA. And so we kind of were like, well, let's go beyond FOIA and see what else we can do. And that's where Secure Drop comes in. And Jen, yeah. Um, yeah, so Secure Drop is a free and open source uh, software project that uh, hopes to make this whistleblowing process easier. So it was a project that was originally written by the late Aaron Swartz and is currently uh, written and maintained by the Freedom of the Press Foundation, which is a nonprofit that ha tries to use tech and journalism together. Uh, so the goal of this project is to reduce risk to sources when they want to leak information to journalists. Um, so, you know, increasingly there is uh, more risk to sources because of the amount of data collection that's occurring. You don't need to go to a journalist and say, hey, who is your source, if you can just uh, get a court order for that journalist's cell phone records, for example, and this is something that has been done. Um, so this is the goal of SecureDrop, to reduce that metadata as much as is possible. So it's an anonymous whistleblowing system uh, that uses Tor, which is an anonymity system, to ensure uh, the anonymity of the source. And along with that comes uh, no logging. So the landing pages for SecureDrop don't log any information about your browser. There's no third-party tracking on the pages. And the uh, source interface itself runs as a Tor hidden service, which is a way to anonymize the server and the client. So another feature of SecureDrop is that all the documents that are submitted are encrypted both in transit and in REST. So if, for example, law enforcement were to raid the location of the SecureDrop servers, all of the source documents are kept encrypted and uh, thus the anonymity of the source is protected. So this is the architecture of SecureDrop. So if a source wanted to uh, leak uh, a document to uh, SecureDrop, they would go through Tor and they would access, uh, it's just a simple web application, which we'll show you what it looks like in a second. And the goal is to make it as easy as possible for people to leak this data, so it's really easy. And then a journalist can come later, can check uh, the server, see if anything has been uploaded, and they can take some documents to an air-gapped machine. So an air-gapped machine is one that has never touched the, uh, touched the internet. And so it's a safe uh, space w to work with these documents. And then if a journalist wants to take these documents and write a story about it, they can then strip off the metadata that may identify the source and then you know, put them on the internet for everyone to see. So there are 25 of these uh, that are publicly deployed right now in the world, including ours, including these places, Washington Post, The Intercept, The New Yorker, ProPublica, um, and there's a full list uh, on securedrop.org slash directory. So if you want to see all of the organizations, many are media organizations, but there are also nonprofits like us that are trying to do this. So this is what the source interface looks like. So it's just like a simple Flask web app. So if you're coming to the first time to the page, you can just click this to submit documents. And to get to this point, all you need to do is go to torproject.org and download the Tor Browser Bundle, which is a special web browser that enables you to use this Tor anonymity network. Um, and we have a page that describes some of the other security concerns that you might want to be aware of if you were to do this. Um, 
And then another thing that sources can do through this uh, interface is talk with journalists. So if you want to have a way that a journalist can talk to someone who has some privileged access without the journalist maybe even being aware of the source's identity, this is a way to do that. Uh, so what we have done is partner with journalists who are interested in having access to a secure drop and who are used to working with sources, know how to work documents. And so these are our first two journalists, Ali Winston, who uh, is uh, at the Center for Investigative Reporting and he covers uh, law enforcement and surveillance. He's written a lot about um, surveillance in Chicago. And another one of our journalists is Paul Gottinger from Reader Supported News, who writes about US foreign policy, uh, the Middle East, and national security. So these are the first two people that will be uh, using documents from our secure drop. So if you have uh, information that you think is uh, something that the public should know, then you can leak documents through this if it is the case that there's a particular journalist, one of these two, who you think uh, would be best suited to uh, look through the documents. You can also say that, uh, and we encourage you to do so. Yep. I think that's it. Mm -hmm. By the way, the <coughs> best ideas are simple ideas, I really like that. Um, have you guys really looked through that uh, airdrop, air gap system, because they're not necessarily as secure as we think they are. They have still a lot of vulnerabilities. Sure. USB drive, could you talk a little bit? Yeah, so with the air gap systems, the process that we go through is we get uh, new laptops, we rip out all of the network hardware physically, we rip out the mics physically, uh, the webcams physically, because uh, there are some of these audio uh, potential ways to get uh, data off of air gap machines. Uh, one obvious issue are these USB drives and any like persistent malware. So. When we boot from these uh, secure viewing stations, it's done with uh, an operating system called Tails, which is a live uh, OS. So, Excellent. yeah. yeah. Really thought that through. Good well, to be clear, like we didn't develop all of this. Like, but yeah. yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like with the secure drop systems, in most cases, they're partnering with institutions, and those institutions are kind of seem that like they're assuming responsibility. It sounds like what you guys are building the wrap around that so that anyone can drop anything and you guys will be responsible for it. It's so else kind of a mixed bag. Anything? So we, we are trying to, so I guess it goes both ways. It, it, we're kind of, we are, we are very careful that there are things that weren't like, if it's, I don't know, someone's, you know, if you're like, oh, I, I don't know, if I just hack this random reporter and here's their home address and they give it to me, I'm not going to put that on the internet ever, right? Um, but it would be the interest that if someone would say, here's Rahm Emanuel's schedule, which, uh, you know, it, he maintains two schedules, right? His public one that he gives to journalists and then the private one where he meets his donors. Someone gives that to me and they say, put it on the internet, that, I, I don't think that that maybe would go through a journalist, um, although that might be the case if it's like a, I don't know, Hillary Clinton's deleted emails, you know, that, that's a whole different story. Um, so I guess the problem that we face is the problem that newsrooms everywhere face. So it's, it's, it's I don't want to say like it comes, it, we don't know the answer, but we also don't know the answer. It really does depend on what comes through the door. Um, I don't have a an answer other than it really does depend on the content. Um, but we do are pretty careful about looking at what comes through, right? But, but you guys are assuming responsibility for that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're acting as a journalism organization, which is one of the reasons why we thought it was so important to partner with journalists who are experienced in doing this so that, you know, we're not just working in a vacuum and we can, you know, work as a newsroom does yeah. to edit these things. And, sorry, can we mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. So since, since the code is open source, is it, theoretically it would be possible for someone to make a fork of that and then allow anonymous people who are in sensitive positions to drop data without being able to trace where it's coming from? 
Yeah, I mean, so that's the intention of this project as it is, is so that people can drop things uh, anonymously. Um, and even the deployment process is done sort of anonymously, like you check out the code from GitHub through Tor anyway. So like, yeah, so a lot of this stuff is done kind of like, like so Freedom of the Press kind of builds the tools, but then it's up to individuals to sort of maintain it and actually like deploy it responsibly, I guess. So a lot of that, yeah, so they, they're kind of like, we'll build the tools and then everyone else just take it and run. If that makes sense. Yeah, I'm curious, so the journalistic organization part, are you seeking out whistleblowers or uh, they're finding you? How do they find you? Or do you know what I'm saying? I mean, we go to things like Shy Hack Night and explain <laughs> to them like that this thing exists. Oh, yeah. uh, so if, you got, if you've got stuff, let us know. So yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, we've got other ideas like, I don't know, you know, wheat pasting around, uh, you know, downtown Chicago. Or, we, we're kind of trying to think these things through, um, but it's a little bit of both. We, we are trying to figure out the best publicity. We're also trying to, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of a big world, so we're, we're still trying to figure out a lot of these things. It, it's, it's been up for a couple of months now. Yeah. Yeah, so. So first of all, I think see here. So you use 10 plus 4, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, we use Tails for administrating uh, the servers and for, for this. So a source does not need to use Tails to submit documents. Tor, right? Yeah, they just need the Tor browser bundle, yeah. And, 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 and another question, what's the difference between the weekly and the Because you, you can have to submit documents uh, using Tor and the weekly. Yeah, so WikiLeaks doesn't use this exact same system, but yeah, someone could also submit to WikiLeaks, you know, if they want to do so. Do you think that your system is more secure than WikiLeaks? Uh, I d would not know enough about the wiki, the way the WikiLeaks submission engine works to judge its security. Um, I think one of the reasons that people might want to drop documents to us is we're the only public deployment in the Midwest and we partner with journalists who are experienced in uh, like writing about uh, surveillance in Chicago, yeah. for example. And, so. and I will also mention that like, while I do have a lot of respect for organizations like ProPublica and the New York Times, that they are also kind of like vanguards of information. And so I don't think that like WikiLeaks, we should just have WikiLeaks or the Pirate Bay or things like that. We need a thousand Pirate Bays. We need a thousand WikiLeaks. Um, and I think centralization is bad, right? I mean, we've, we grew up in the 90s or some of us even earlier. We know that that's the case. So why not have thousands of people running secure jobs? Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah. Oh, yeah. So I, I don't know how their submission engine works on the back end either. Yeah. Um, yeah, do I really go ahead? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, at the beginning, you kind of said, okay, so sysadmins and activists and journalists, it's kind of like get together and do this, science. but I'm um, sorry? It's it's data, science. Yeah. Data, science. data scientists, everything. Okay, so how did that happen? How did this get yeah, started? Good. Yeah, so we all, like everyone in LPL, <laughs> uh, <laughs> met each other through doing digital security trainings through something called Crypto Party uh, Chicago. Um, so that's how we all met each other and we got to talking about uh, these issues and this sort of arose from that work. Yeah, and yeah. Other, another thing that happened is you kind of, I, I don't know if this happens to other people, for me, I, I got one FOIA document and I was like, it was over redacted and it was a database that I have like 20 records for already. So I know exactly what it is that they redacted. It was the name of a database that they used to look people up in. And I just was furious. I think it was like a Tuesday morning. I was like, screw this. <laughs> Let's just go do something else. So a lot of the, these things kind of happened just kind of, I don't know, just like random chance occurrence. So if it wasn't for that one CPD officer who just redacted out a little line, these things wouldn't happen. So I don't know. So I think for me, um, it was just kind of like, little moments that just said like, okay, we're, we're doing these things and they're interesting, but like, let's take it to a different level because there, there's other impactful work that we can do. And like administrating a secure drop instance, where else is admins? I, I administer 40,000 VMs. I, I can do another 
12 computers or whatever it is. So that's kind of how that happens, too. Um, so uh, you guys are, um, uh, you guys have set up this, sec this secure drop system. I'm kind of curious about like the, the ecosystem that is sort of developing. You've got 25 of them now, right? Are you finding that you know, the New York Times covers certain things? It sounds like you were alluding to that in your previous uh, answer. Have you found that there's a need at the local level uh, for, for doing like you know, Chicago specific or Midwest specific document leaks? And have you seen other examples of local governments releasing or leaking things through secure drop uh, that maybe we've heard about before? Um, yeah, so like one challenge with finding out about other secure drops is that people often don't want to even say when a story resulted from a leak that came through secure drop because that may give some information to an adversary that might be trying to figure out who was leaking this data so like even if figuring out where the stories are coming from is sometimes uh, unclear so people don't want to talk about it. so i actually don't know the answer to those two last questions yeah. have you thought about making any so if any, yeah. That. So if anyone yeah. <laughs> from Chicago Police Department wants to whistleblow to us, I will gladly take it. Um, I, I haven't. I didn't even know they had a whistleblower program. Um, if it even was, internally, it seems like it would be useful. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge, right? Because with institutions, again, I kind of alluded this to this earlier. If they so there are whistleblowing pro programs, but like what we saw today, there was, there was like a $2 million settlement for a whistleblower, two cops that blew the whistle and they got, you know, um, punished. Um, so the internal checks of institutions, like they don't really want to be subverted internally because if that, they allowed that to happen, then they would like cease to function. Um, so it's very kind of, I can see why, why you know, you need external checks and so that's where we stand, stand in. If they want us to like give this exact same presentation, why not? I mean, having a secure up for journalism is one thing and is obviously, we think it's very useful, but it seems like the same architecture could be very useful just internally for an organization where maybe, you know, because of some social constructs, it's difficult for people to speak up about something that they see. So I yeah. think for police, it would be very useful. Yeah, I'm free on Thursday. So. Uh, most Fortune 50 companies have very good whistleblowing program for themselves because they're afraid that their stuff will go to journalists, they'd rather catch it themselves. But do they and really? They're very, they're very hmm. this thing about it, they're, they're, they're very good officers at that level who take care of these things. Hmm. But they're very, I mean, they're as dedicated as you are to that system. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway. Well, it's okay. Interesting. It's an interesting discussion, anyway. More questions, yeah? Um, what risks still exist for the whistleblowers? Like, for example, could misconfiguration on the part of the institution put them at risk if it's not set up properly? Are there any sort of dangers like that? So, yeah, so there are two primary risks for whistleblowers. The first is, you know, sort of um, their, them making first contact. That's always the, the hardest contact with any kind of journalism uh, contacting. So, one of the things we mentioned is like, don't do this from your workplace, don't do this from your house, go to the coffee shop on Western, Ipsento Coffee, they've got open Wi-Fi, do it there. Um, and then the, the, the misconfiguration, there are always, you know, this is software, we, we all work with software, we know that there are problems. Um, we, uh, there have been three independent security audits of uh, SecureDrop by NCC Group, which is a fantastic security research group in Chicago and around the world. Um, and they have found no major vulnerabilities. There's been one in, I think, PyWiki. Um, but other than that, I mean, the, the level of hardening that's done on the, on the servers is, is really like world class. Um, it's hard to find even that level of hardening in enterprise level software, um, so. One, uh, well, one related issue is uh, documents often have metadata, which we keep in there because it can be useful to authenticate documents. Uh, but if a source is concerned about being de-anonymized, like the reason we have this intermediate step here is to strip out metadata. Uh, but if a source is particularly concerned about that, then they can strip it out themselves before they submit them. And we talk about how to do that on our landing page. 
one more question. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not, I'm not super familiar with privacy and security in general, so maybe I'll just use an extreme example. Um, well, let's say if, like, if someone wanted to use this architecture for this platform, like say someone worked here at Frankie, mm -hmm. and they just wanted to like drop people's payment information mm -hmm. uh, anonymously and use it for stuff. I mean, is, is there any safeguard against uh, that sort of system being used? Yeah. Share sensitive information that we mm -hmm. you know, want to be shared. I mean, people can do that with existing tools mm -hmm. is one thing. Mm -hmm. Like if someone has privileged access, they can do it with existing tools. Um, yeah. And there's like a process of vetting. So we don't, like when things are dropped, like this is one uh, mm -hmm. thought that people have had about this or misconception that people have had that, oh, when things go on the server, then you can just like, you know, anyone can go and lock up like what's been dropped. And clearly that's not the case. So we can go through and say, okay, well, this is again, legitimate. Okay, sure. Someone could set up the room. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. There are filters. The filters are the people that administer the, the programs, the journalists who go and check and all that. Um, there's nothing to stop some rogue actor from just downloading the source code, setting one up, and saying, like, give me all of your hacks of uh, Sony Group or whatever. You know, that, that's always a possibility, but like, that's the case of setting up a you know, paste bin open source or whatever. You know, that's, that's not a thing that we can prevent. Thank you very much.